Welcome everyone to Fair Territory. I am Ken Rosenthal here with Alana Rizzo. We want you to get your questions in because my goodness, <laughs> Alana, we have a lot to talk about this morning. Some breaking news out of the Bay Area. Yeah, so let's get you set up. I, yeah, I wanted to get you set up because before we get into it, Kenny, we were talking about the fact, that, you know, when we did our production meeting this morning, this was not the lead, but it is the lead now. The <laughs> Oakland Athletics announcing about an hour ago that they are going to spend the 25 through 27 season in Sacramento. So I would like to welcome a new city to Major League Baseball and a new glorious minor league ballpark to Major League Baseball. <laughs> 14,000 seat capacity. Yes, Sacramento is going to be a major league city, at least for three years, maybe more. This might be their bid for an expansion team down the line. And while the stadium is not major league quality, and that's going to be a big issue for the Players Association, the fact that the facilities are not going to be major league caliber, the city itself is the 20th largest market in the nation, media market. Las Vegas is 40th. So... From some respects, in certain respects, Sacramento is a better choice than Vegas. But no, 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 that's not the plan, Alana. The plan is three years in Sacramento with an option for a fourth in case the Vegas stadium is not done. And then they will move on to their ballpark in Las Vegas. Now, this is an interesting move for a lot of reasons. One, the A's last year in Oakland, under their TV deal with NBC Sports California, received $67 million dollars. And the estimates are that they would be getting $70 million if they had stayed in the Bay Area going forward. Now, I am sure that number will be reduced, and yet they still want to leave Oakland for these next three years because, of course, a lot of a local Oakland is not a great place for them. Now, as I reported a couple of months ago, the plan, the A's plan, and they always have plans, is to increase their payroll to the $130 to $150 million range while they are ramping up in Sacramento and then get to 170 by the time they're in Vegas. As I wrote then, I'll believe it when I see it. And this move, while being trumpeted by Major League Baseball, Alana, I want to hear your thoughts on it because major leaguers in minor league facilities, that's going to be a real interesting thing to try to sell to the Players Association and to the players themselves. Ken, some people might argue, though, that the Coliseum is a minor league ballpark as well. And I don't know that keeping them in Oakland for the next three years only to ultimately move them out of Oakland to get to Las Vegas or wherever it is that they end up is a good answer either. I think this is better than just kind of like slowly moving the Band-Aid off of the wound. This is kind of like, let's just rip it off and get out of Oakland entirely. There's so much bad blood that has happened between the city, the team, the fans, the ownership group. I think it's probably best to get them out of Oakland. And I feel so badly for the fans because they've lost everything. They lost the Raiders. They lost the Warriors. They're losing, again, another professional sports franchise. But perhaps this is a move that they need. Maybe there will be some generated interest in Sacramento. It's only 14,000 seats as far as the ballpark is concerned, about 10,000 seats. And then with the berm area, it's about 14,000 people that can fit in. But right now they're getting about 3,000 a game, Ken. So, you know, I don't like the move. I think it, it stinks for the city of Oakland, but, or, you know, for the fans, I should say. Not, I don't even care about the city, but the fan base there, that bothers me. But again, this is going to have to be approved by the union and they're going from one minor league ballpark to another. Alana, I'm not going to argue the point that they need to get out of Oakland. I would argue though, from a greater global perspective that this whole thing from point a, where it started to point B, where it's supposed to end in Las Vegas has been an absolute charade. And yes, they have to get out of Oakland. Yes. They had to find a new home. Sacramento is probably more feasible than Salt Lake city where they would not get any TV money or at least the same amount. And it's more feasible than Vegas where you can't play outdoors. It's still hot in Sacramento in the summertime, as we know. But my point here is that this whole thing, this is Major League Baseball. And this is what Major League Baseball has agreed to let the owner of the A's, John Fisher, do. Play in a minor league stadium for three years. Admittedly, he's playing in a great, or not a great ballpark now. And then... Go to a city where we don't know if it's going to work. We don't even know if the A's are going to totally get there because, of course, this thing is still somewhat tenuous. That's my problem with it, Alana, the whole thing. But you know what? Let's talk about baseball. Let's talk about at least one hot team right now. 
<laughs> the New York Yankees off to a six in one road trip. They look tremendous. I don't know that there's ever been anybody in recent days that looks better in a Yankee uniform than Juan Soto. Doesn't it just seem to fit Ken? He just seems to want to be there. Absolutely right, Alana. And this team is really interesting right now. And of course, if we're talking about hot teams, we could be talking about the six and two Dodgers who look tremendous. But the Yankees, they're six and one playing on the road in Houston and in Arizona, a team that went to the ALCS last year and a team that went to the World Series. They're doing this without Gary Cole and DJ LeMahieu, and they're doing it really with only three hot hitters. Now, and this was until yesterday. Judge had a home run yesterday, got a big night. Verdugo as well. But before that, it was really Oswaldo Cabrera, Juan Soto, mm -hmm. and Anthony Volpe. That was it. And the fact that they're banking wins now without Cole, and who knows how long exactly he'll be out. That's a really good sign. And the one overlooked thing about this team right now, we've talked a lot about Soto, of course, and rightly so. You're right, Alana. He fits perfectly. He's had a tremendous impact on the lineup in general. But their bullpen, I'm talking about Clay Holmes, Ian Hamilton, Loisaga, Ferguson, and Birdie. Five relievers to this point. Those five combined 19 and a third innings, no earned runs. So it's a great start for the Yankees. Does it mean that they're going to be there at the end? No. If you go to September, fast forward in your head, you probably won't even be thinking that they started the season 6-1. and one. Probably won't even remember it. But for the Yankees, who had some questions around them, their lineup look, looks much more balanced. And in general, they look much more like a championship caliber team than certainly they did last season. I don't know that we would have thought that the Yankees bullpen would have been that strong. I don't know that we would have thought that the Tigers bullpen would have been that strong either, Ken. A .58 ERA for the Tigers relieving core. But one thing about Soto before we move on to some uh, Larry Lucchino memories is Juan Soto is doing it in all ways, right? He's doing it with line drives all over the field. He's clearing the fences. He has the strong throws. You know, he's he's doing it defensively as well. And I think that was probably the only knock on him, right? We knew he was a great offensive player, but he's been able to contribute on both sides of the ball. No question, Alana. And I wrote about this earlier in the week. He, this winter, spent some time with Jackie Bradley Jr., one of the great outfielders, really, of this generation from a defensive standpoint. And he wanted to get better. He thought it was important to get better. Now, you might say, well, of course, it's his free agent year. He's going to try his best. <laughs> but Soto was a good outfielder in Washington, not a great outfielder, but certainly adequate. And he, from what we've seen so far, has gotten back to that. The routes are better. The throws, as you mentioned, are much better. The overall awareness is better. He's worked at it, and he's continued to work at it with Luis Rojas, who is their third base coach and outfield instructor. And it, it speaks well of Soto. Yes, he's a free agent. I get it. But to go and make the extra effort this year, because as he said, defense does win championships. That shows you something about the player he wants to be. He doesn't want to be just this offensive force. He wants to be a better defender and a better base runner. If I'm the New York Yankees, I'm locking up Juan Soto to a long-term deal before he hits that free agent market. Staying in the AL East, let's talk a little bit about the Boston Red Sox as far as Larry Lucchino is concerned. He passed away at the age of 78 after an illness. And Kenny, I have to say, this is a man that has had such an unbelievable mark in the game of baseball, not just for the Red Sox, but for many different franchises. What will you remember about him? I remember riding in a cab with him to the new Comiskey Park in 1991. And Larry was the president of the Orioles at that time. I was working for the Baltimore Sun. And we're on our way. Comiskey had just opened. It's now, what, Guaranteed Rate Field or whatever it's called. And <laughs> Lucchino was ripping the park to me, saying, this place is not good. They didn't design it well. Wait until you see what we have in store in Baltimore next year. What happened next year? Camden Yards opened. That was a park that he was a big part in creating. He wasn't the only guy with the vision. Janet Marie Smith was part of that mm -hmm. as well. But he played a major role, his vision of what he wanted a ballpark in an urban area to be. Took that vision to San Diego, was the driving force behind Petco, took it to Boston, where they kept Fenway Park, thank goodness. And with Janet Marie Smith, they incorporated some renovations. I can't say it's updated exactly, but they made that park even better. So that's just part of his story because, of course, he was the president of the Boston Red Sox when they won 
three World Series titles. He was the guy who coined the Yankees, the evil empire. He was someone who was incredibly difficult to work for in many ways and to deal with in many ways. He was impatient. He could be condescending, but he was a guy who wanted to win. He was a guy who was very passionate about what he was involved with. And even though I had my battles with him at times over the years, going back to the Baltimore days, he is someone who, from what I could see from fan comments over the last few days, is being remembered very fondly. And that's as it should be. Steve Buckley in The Athletic wrote that Larry Lucchino should be in the Hall of Fame. I 100% agree. His influence and impact on the sport is almost unparalleled in the ways that he did it. You would not be alone in that uh, you had your run-ins with him because he certainly had a reputation, Ken, of being a guy that was abrasive and, and hard to work for. But in that, there was also the appreciation of how he made people around him better. You mentioned Janet Marie Smith, who had a hand in, in making uh, Camden Yards as well as you know upgrading Dodger Stadium and, and Petco Park and, and on and on and on and on. And I had a conversation with her after the passing of Larry Lucchino, and she said that he just made her work smarter. He made her work better. He learned She learned so much from being around him and working for him that it, you can't take away the, the amount of good that he did in the game. And also, Sean McAdam was on uh, High Heat the other day and had a conversation about how after the – Red Sox won the 2004 World Series championship for the first time in a billion years. He walked into Terry Francona's office and said, hey, we need to get these guys in full uniform to get on these duck boats and go on and, and do this parade. And Terry Francona said, absolutely not. I'm not going to ask my players who have been, you know, or probably still hung over from the championship to get in full uniform to do this. And it was rumored that Larry Lucchino screaming at the top of his lungs to Terry Francona said, God, you can't get these guys to do anything for you. And it was, he had just won the World Series with this group of guys. But again, it was, he always wanted perfection. He always wanted um, to, to, to put his best foot forward. And I do agree with you as well. I, I do believe that Larry Lucchino should be in, in, the, in the Hall of Fame just because of the mark that he's left on this great game. And one thing I failed to mention and is really key to this whole conversation. Larry Lucchino was not the guy who brought Theo Epstein into the game, but he was there in Baltimore when Theo joined that organization as an intern. Theo had made a connection through Calvin Hill, who was then in the Orioles front office. And then Lucchino took Theo Epstein to San Diego and then brought him to Boston to be the youngest general manager in baseball history at the time, age 28. It was Theo who put together the team that ended the curse of the Bambino and Lucchino who was the team president at that time. I mean, he ended curses for two teams. I mean, he ended droughts for two teams, the Boston Red Sox, and as you just mentioned, the Chicago comes. So may he rest in peace, Larry Lucchino, uh, should definitely be in the Hall of Fame. All right, moving on now to Grill and Ken. This is your opportunity to get questions in, to ask Ken Rosenthal uh, his thoughts on certain things. And we'll start with this. Um, Shota Imanaga's gem, uh, keeping that in mind, Ken, best major league debut you have ever seen. Actually, it happened last year, Alana. Sal Freelich comes up to Milwaukee, and we had the game on Fox. And it's always cool. A Major League debut. You've covered a number of them. They are great. The family is there. It's a cool night. He goes three for three with a sacrifice fly. He makes two tremendous catches in right field. Drove in the tying run and the go-ahead run. That was the best debut I've ever seen. It was a blast to cover. And Sal Freelich, by the way, looks like he's going to be a really good player for a long time. Yeah, I love I love debuts. They're always so much fun. And it, it, of course, it's just such a culmination of all of the hard work that comes from trying to get into this great game. It's hard to get here. It's even harder to stay. I'm going to go back to June of 2010. So 14 years ago, which is hard enough to believe Steven Strasburg's debut with the Washington Nationals. Now, remember, as you know, number one pick in 2009, so hyped, so much expectation for this young man. And he really delivered in his major league debut. He goes seven innings, Ken, two earned runs, four Four hits, but it was the 14 punch outs and zero walks that was so impressive. The swing and miss was there. It was just a 21 year old kid and we knew he was going to be something special. So that is to me the one that I actually witnessed. And then I wanted to go back and bring up Willie McCovey's back in 1959. And I know you've been doing this a long time, Ken Rosenthal, but you weren't <laughs> even at Willie McCovey's debut. Now, 
keep in mind that Willie McCovey did not make his debut until the 101st game of the season for the San Francisco Giants. And what's crazy about that is he goes four for four, two triples. He only had 46 triples in his big league career, two of which came on the day that he made his debut. And what's even crazier about is I mentioned 101st game of the season. He doesn't make his debut until he still ended up, Ken, winning the National League Rookie of the Year. That's how impressive Willie McCovey was. He was 21 years old at the time, same age as Steven Strasburg. But imagine being there and watching this kid come up and say, wow, this amazing. guy's this guy is pretty story. special. I was not even aware of that, Alana. I did attend Strasburg's debut because my memory is failing. I didn't remember it as vividly as Freelix. But anyway, <laughs> both of those that you just mentioned were tremendous. All right. You know, it's fun, too, because I... I think about all the stuff that you have probably seen in your career. I give you a pass. Freelix was just last year. <laughs> but besides Freelix, is there any other that stick out to you? There is one. It's not that notable. But Cole Tucker, when he made his debut for the Pittsburgh Pirates. And the reason I'll say this, it was a Pittsburgh Pirates-San Francisco Giants game in April. And not that I ever complain about where I go on a given weekend, but I was thinking, what are we doing covering the Pirates and Giants in April of 2019? That day, Cole Tucker and Brian Reynolds, who of course became a really good player, made their debuts. Cole Tucker hit his home run that day. His parents were in the stands, and you've done this a lot, and we all have done this. It's so much fun to interview the parents on the day of their son's debut. He hit the homer. It was a big day for him, and I'll always remember that one as well. Now, Cole Tucker is now married to Vanessa Hutchins, and they're about to have their first baby. My, how time just flies right by. <laughs> yes, I'm sure exactly you care all right. about that pop culture. All right, Grill and Ken, we have our first question. And, of course, it is about the Oakland A's and uh, their owner, John Fisher. And this is, comes from Caleb Davis. Is there a way to force him out of ownership? Will we ever see baseball in Oakland again? I don't know that there's a way to force him out of ownership other than if he is financially negligent in the way he operates the team, the way the McCourt family was in running the Dodgers some years ago. Then you would have grounds to get them out. But it's a private enterprise. He basically has the right to run the franchise however he wants it. MLB is very laissez-faire in that regard. They do not hold owners to any particular standard. They don't say you have to win to keep your team. It's not like that. These guys own the teams. They can do what they want, and let's not forget, MLB approved this move and has been behind it from the start. Now, the better question is the second one you asked, Caleb. Will Oakland be in position to get an expansion team? They're going to try. And in fact, the offer that they made to Oakland or the Oakland A's in negotiating with them for the possibility of the A's staying in Oakland for the next three years included the right to work with MLB on exclusivity for an expansion team, finding a new owner, etc. They have always maintained, the mayor of Oakland and everyone she works with, that they have a plan. They can get a new stadium built downtown, beautiful setting, and they have what they say are people willing to invest and buy a team. I don't know why you would want to leave the best market really that's remaining right now in baseball, the Bay Area, seventh largest TV market in the country, and not go back. So we'll see how this transpires. There's certainly no feeling on MLB's side that Oakland is that viable, that their plans have been that viable. Oakland insists otherwise. But if you're looking for places to go in expansion, you'd want to go to the biggest markets, I would think. And you'd want to give Oakland another look under a new owner. Ken, why would people believe that they're willing or can get a stadium in place, a new stadium for an expansion team, when they weren't able to do it for a team that's been in that current location for 57 years? Great question, Alana, and it's a very fair question. But I've talked quite a bit with the mayor in the last year, really. And she maintains and she presented to Rob Manfred at the All-Star Game last year a lengthy set of blueprints and plans and financing for a new ballpark. MLB has always maintained, the A's have always maintained that it's insufficient. It can't get it done. Oakland insists otherwise. I would at least, if I were Rob Manfred, want to have that conversation again. And if they have a deep pockets owner, Joe LaCobe, maybe the owner of the Warriors, who wants to get in there and wants to, of course, help with that construction, why wouldn't you want the Bay Area back with two teams? 
Oh, I agree with you. I, again, I feel very, very sad for the, the fans in Oakland. They've just been stripped of every professional team that they have. All right, we have a super chat next as we continue with Grill and Ken here. And Shang Tao is also on foul territory during um, Fans Fest. And he wants to know, Ken, do the New York Yankees go after Soto as far as a long-term deal? We were just talking about that. I think they should lock him up forever, but um, it doesn't matter what I think. What do you think about making sure Soto finishes his career in pinstripe? Obviously, they should lock him up forever, right? You have a player who is going to be a free agent at 26. The problem is Scott Boris is his agent. Scott Boris knows and Juan Soto knows that on the open market, he is going to crush it. And remember, Soto turned down $440 million for 15 years from the Washington Nationals in 2022. That's what led to his trade to the Padres. He turned it down in part because he thought he could get more. And given that Shohei Otani has set the bar even higher, albeit with a deferred deal, Juan Soto, to me, is looking at $500 million plus because of his age, because of his historic accomplishment, because of all that he is still likely to accomplish in his career. So would the Yankees like to get this done right now? I'm sure they would. But Brian Cashman has said they fully expect Juan Soto to go to free agency because generally speaking, that is what Scott Boris clients do in search of their full market value. Why not negotiate with 30 teams rather than negotiate with only one? And I know 30 teams won't be involved, but you know what I'm saying. The open market presents competition and it gives Soto the chance to drive that number even higher. So did this offseason too, Ken, with a lot of Scott Boris's clients, and you and I have talked about this before in terms of agent over-promising. Um, does that happen again in, in, in this upcoming offseason, do you think, with a $500 million price tag? I don't think you can screw up Juan Soto's free agency, Alana. I just don't know that it's possible. And remember, Boris, while he had a difficult offseason, there's no question about it. He might not admit it, but we know it. Going back to 2019-20, that offseason, he had Cole, he had Rendon, he had Strasburg. All three of those guys crushed it. And Soto, to me, is like a hitting version of Cole in that he's the best at his position, the best in the game. And when you have that kind of player, you're not going to miss. Now, Boris has argued, listen, people knew Cody Bellinger had had a couple of bad years. People knew Blake Snell had had some difficult seasons or average seasons between his Cy Young award-winning campaigns. These were guys with warts. I don't know that Juan Soto is going to have any warts. And I don't know that if I was his representative, I could screw up a $500 million deal. Listen, I've been asking Scott Boris to be my agent for decades, and he refuses to take me on as a client. So here we go. All right, last question for you. It is about the auto strike zone. This is a big topic of conversation. Mm -hmm. Scott, could you ask Ken about uh, Scott? Well, Scott, it's actually me now because it's Alana. So let's see. <laughs> could you ask Ken about how Major League Baseball is thinking about the bad home plate umpiring of late? Does the umpire union agree with an automated strike zone? The automated strike zone is coming. The question is when. And if you're going to implement this, you're going to have to, one, decide how you're going to use it as a challenge system for every call, just the way that you're going to implement this. And the other part of it is you have to perfect it. And that, to me, is one of the issues here. You've got to make sure that the strike zone is fair for a player as short as Jose Altuve and a player as tall as Aaron Judge. Mm -hmm. And let's face it, Alana, yes, there is human error with the current system with umpires behind the plate, but for the most part, and people I know don't recognize this, these guys get 98, 99% right. So you've got to be at that level, if not higher. And it's probably something we're going to see in the near future. I don't know exactly when, but they've tried it in the minor leagues and certainly it's the way the game is heading. All right, Scarlet and Blue, thank you for that question about the automated strike zone. It is time now to move on from Grill and Ken to Dude and Dork. I'm always easily defining a dude. It's sometimes it's harder to find a dork. But let's start with the Dude of the Week for you, Ken. Who is it? Well, it could easily be Mookie Betts, but it probably could be Mookie Betts every week. <laughs> so I'm going to go with Juan Soto. And Juan Soto, for the way he has transformed the Yankees for the series he had in Houston in particular, in which Every game he left his mark, either offensively or defensively. Juan Soto to me is a pretty obvious choice for dude of the week, but Alana, I've got to say, 
Mookie might even be more obvious. I just expect Mookie's going to win it again and again and again because he's yeah. Why? Why? Star. Because he has five home runs in his first eight games. He's tearing the cover off the ball. I don't know how he wasn't the reigning National League Player of the Week. No disrespect to Luda Scuriel, but I mean Mookie Betts. My goodness, but I didn't pick him for the same reason that you. I picked Ronel Blanco of the Houston Astros. The reason being, Ken, is what a couple of weeks for this young man. He finds out basically at the end of spring training that he made the major league roster as far as opening day is concerned and the same day he welcomes in his second child a daughter and then he finds out he makes the team and then he throws the first no hitter of 2024 so we didn't know a lot about this guy i'm sure the houston astros did but you know they signed him um in the international market and good for him congratulations and, and what a moment for that young man what a couple of weeks for that young man all right what about your dork of the week who's that well Alana, we should rename this the John Fisher Dork of the Week because, of course, he wins it so often and the A's win it so often. I'm going to give it to the A's in general, not just John Fisher. Three reasons, just three this week from the That's A's. it? That's all you got? The Asturi the Ruiz demotion is at the bottom of this. I didn't like it, but I understood where David Force, the GM, was coming from. Number two on the A's ridiculousness of the week would be the memo that was sent out to some of their concessionaires about how to conduct themselves during games, basically saying, if you see anything that says rooted in Oakland, I guess in the merchandise, take it down. You don't want that. And try not to highlight any product with Oakland in it. Now we understand why the A's are instructing their concessionaires this, but my favorite part of this is, if attendance is under 5,000 for the game, we'll be closing gate C. Well, guess what? You're not getting It's always, 5, yeah, There's it's always 3,500 that night. So oh. that's my number two reason. And of course, number one will be this whole fiasco, the Oakland, Sacramento, Vegas A's. Again, I will believe everything is wonderful as Major League Baseball is promising, as John Fisher is promising. I will believe it all is the land of Oz. When the A's get to Vegas, when they open that park, and when they run that $170 million payroll that they have talked about doing. Let's see it. Let's this see it entire happen. thing has been an absolute disaster from start to finish. You could not have mismanaged this worse than what the Oakland A's have done. My dork of the week is whoever decided to put Jackson Holiday in the minor leagues and keep him there through seven games of the season. I understand Gunnar Henderson is a is a Good, could be great player, yes, but Jackson Holiday is on another level. So far in minor leagues, 400 average Ken, two home runs, eight RBI, one stolen base. His OPS is 1.248. Put the kid on the roster, find a spot for him. Put him at short, put him at second, put him at, I don't care, put him behind the plate. Get rid of Adley Rutschman. I'm kidding, I'm kidding with Adley <laughs> Rutschman. But the point is Jackson Holiday is already a major league player. He was already a major leaguer when he was three years old. I watched him in the Rockies clubhouse when his dad was in the Rockies system. So that is my uh, dork of the week. Um, again, Alana, I'm, I, with I'm with you. I'm with you on this. He definitely is deserving. They've got two other prospects, Kerstad and Mayo, who also are deserving. The problem this team has, and it's crazy <laughs> to say this, they've got too many good players. Jordan Westberg, who would be, I guess, the guy they would get rid of for Holiday, he had a game-winning homer the other night. So that's the problem here. We all want to see Jackson Holiday. We're going to see Jackson Holiday at some point. But the Orioles are just loaded. Best farm system in the game, and it shows. And they're coming off a 100-and-1 season last year. So good for them. I'm happy that the Orioles are doing well. And I love the new ownership group. They're already doing things the right way with uh, David Rubenstein at the helm. Well, that is going to do it for Foul Territory with Ken Rosenthal, the live edition. We appreciate you watching. And again, please do so uh, continuously. You can watch. You can listen. You can like us. Subscribe on YouTube, Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcast. Foul Territory is next. And then Dodgers Territory this afternoon at 3 p.m. Eastern and another Fair Territory with Kenny on Monday. We appreciate you watching. Have a great day, y'all.